thanks for having me here today. It's a blessing to be here. Um, I think some of you probably saw me in a video back in the winter. I was going to be here in person, and it was that insanely cold weekend uh, where we didn't feel like it was safe to come out. So I'm happy I get to be here because I didn't have to preach at home, too. Uh, last time I had a video ready to go for each place. I didn't know which place I was going to be, and you guys got the video, and they got me live this time. I'm just here. I didn't have to worry about anything else today, which is wonderful. Um, a bit about myself. Uh, all of my official employment has been in ministry jobs, with one aside of high school being at Boy Scout camp on staff, and some detasseling, which if you've ever done that, don't. Um, if you've, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, fortunately, the technology gets better, and the machines pull a few more tassels every year, I think. So it's not as hard to do that. But man, that was some hard work. Uh, and I think I bought my first electric guitar with that paycheck. And that's about all, you know, a week and a half of detasseling covered was one starter guitar. So right now, I'm a pastor in Emmanuel in Story City out in central Iowa. And can I just say, it was a blessing. You're talking about sunrises. Uh, I got up at 6 and started heading this way, and it was a beautiful morning to drive across the state of Iowa. And I feel very strongly that God has called me to be in this place, like this state of Iowa. Uh, I lived in Kentucky for two years. It was not home. It was not Iowa. And so God pulled us back and said, now you know, this is what I have made you for. So um, it was a great just blessing to have that drive with the sunrise this morning and seeing the mist over every little body of water along Highway 30. It was great. So, so I grew up in Cedar Falls. Um, I made it down this way a few times here and there for concerts. My favorite concert of all time was Switchfoot at a place I think called Let's Dance. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Maybe, yeah, it was a country line dance bar. This was back in 2003. Uh, if we had stuck around later, the band actually stayed to do karaoke, which would have been really fun. We saw pictures of it later, unfortunately. We couldn't stay. But I also got to come out this way uh, when my brother worked at Rockwell Collins for a little while and um, on day camps with Riverside Bible Camp, where I worked many summers. We came out to Faith Lutheran here up in Marion. Uh, three summers in a row I got to come and get to know the area. So right now I am married, uh, going on 15 years and that's crazy. My wife, Allison, is also on staff at Emanuel. She's our uh, youth and family person right now. And she has a year left in school as well. She's about done with her MDiv as well at the same seminary that I went to, the Master's Institute that Jody went to. Um, and we have three kids, Josiah, who is 10, Annabelle, who is 8, and Sammy, who is 5. So life is very full uh, in many different ways, but God is doing some pretty neat things. Um, in this place. And God is doing some pretty neat things in our lives. Um, and so to be here today, Jody and I, as she mentioned, went to seminary together. And, and I'm also happy to be here because I don't wear jeans at my 100 plus year old formal, you know, stained glass sanctuary back at home. I wear jeans here. And I'm really happy about that because I feel way more comfortable dressed this way than how I dress there often. So if anyone from Emmanuel is watching online, sorry, that's the truth. <laughs> So however trivial some of those things were, I want to dig into our topic today. Uh, nothing like a little coaching, right? Sometimes we need some coaching in our lives. It's the reality. And I happen to be wired very independently. Um, you know the shirts that say doesn't work well with others. Uh, mine would just say wired independently, and it would be a little more sophisticated of way of saying that. Um, or maybe it's more accurate I don't always work well for supervisors, potentially supervisors that don't know me well or know how to communicate with me. I tend to be kind of artistic, so I wrap up a lot of the value of myself in the product of my work. And I've had to learn over the years to accept some coaching. I've had to be mindful of this in my life and in my ministry. And maybe there's times where you've been coached and you've had great experiences, and maybe there's times where you've been coached and it has not gone so well. For many of us, that might be the case. But as I see it today, especially with this series and this passage, I see a need for the church, the body of Christ, which is us and all followers of Jesus across the world, to lay down our pride and allow God to work in us and to form us and to allow others in the church to like speak good things into our lives and help be that process for us as well. 
and to open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit to guide us and to counsel us and to coach us, it's a great need. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that throughout here. Um, I feel like one of the passions God has given me is to see the body of Christ wake up in this country and in the Western world where uh, life is pretty comfortable with or without the church, right? Most people in our culture live very comfortably with or without Jesus. And the church has an uphill battle if we want the message of the gospel to land, right? And I believe God wants it to land and he wants to empower us. And so you're going to hear a thread through here. I just want to see God's people wake up, right? I want to see the church do what God intended the church to do, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to move, to listen, to participate. We need that motivation. We need that correction in our lives. We need to be coached. We need to be challenged. If we're not being challenged, we're not growing, right? How many of you have ever gone to the weight room to work out and get strong and not ever challenged yourself? Are you going to get strong if you don't push yourselves, if you don't accept that challenge? If we're not finding discomfort when we measure our lives to the true life of the scriptures and the life of Jesus Christ, then we're either avoiding the issues or we think too highly of ourselves, right? We should be convicted and challenged as we read God's word, as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. So I think we need to be honest with ourselves. And when I say we, I mean me as well. And I mean the body of Christ in this country, in the Western world. We need to be honest. We need to be able, as a faith community, as a church, to be challenged and to accept that challenge and rise up to it. And we need to continue to grow and have our trajectory aimed at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's where all the grace and all the empowerment that we need comes from. You've been working through Acts chapter 3, and we have this great testimony of what Peter and John are experiencing when the church is like this new, incredible thing, just getting off the ground. And a lot of pastors who have a passion to see God's church reignite, we go back to the book of Acts. Like we see it when it was a new thing, when uh, the Holy Spirit was poured out on followers of Jesus and things start to come alive. And there's this godly, supernatural power and fervor that is fueling everything that they do. And that doesn't mean it was easy, but man, was it good, right? Right? Because God's kingdom, which I'm going to explain a little bit later, God's kingdom was coming on earth as it was in heaven, just as Jesus prayed when he gave us what we call today the Lord's Prayer. So Peter and John have this, through God's power and through God's timing, end up in a situation here, and it offers them an incredible opportunity to tell some people about the good news, right, that they've been entrusted with. God works through Peter to show his compassion and his authority over disease and paralysis at the beautiful gate. This man is healed. This man's life has changed just like that in an instant because of the power of God in his life. And this guy then sticks with Peter and John as they go into the temple gates, the Solomon's courtyard. And everyone, including the man who was healed, needs a little bit of context. They need a little bit of coaching on what just happened, right? Because they need to know the true facts of where this power and where this miracle came from. So Peter and John begin telling the story, and they're not just telling the story of the healing. In fact, they didn't actually walk through. Oh, well, we walked up to the gate, and we saw this guy here, and our heart was moved with compassion, and we listened to what the Holy Spirit... Like, they didn't go through this thing, right? Because the story is so much bigger... And people already see that this man was healed. Like, the the reality of that is evidenced, right? And so they tell the whole story of Israel and of Jesus and the coming of kingdom of God through the church and the fire of the Holy Spirit igniting God's people. So one of the terms I am going to use a lot today is the kingdom of God. And it's kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is used synonymously in the New Testament. Um, They're pointing at the same thing. And so the simplest definition I think we can use of that is the kingdom of God in Christianity is the spiritual realm over which God reigns as king 
and or the fulfillment of on earth of God's will. So God is the Lord of the heavens, right? Like there is this domain, this dominion where God is king, where Jesus is king. And that's the reality that we submit to as the body of Christ here on earth. But then we also say the kingdom of God is where we see God's will on earth as it is in heaven, as it is in that domain. And so when I'm talking about the kingdom of God, I'm referencing that God is in fact king, like Jesus is king, and there are times and places and opportunities for kingdoms, for God's kingdom to break through here on earth as well. And we see that reality become more of a reality here for us. Maybe just in an instant or in a place or for a season, but God is always doing that through his church, throughout the whole world. So it's God's reign over everything as sovereign Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it's when we see God's work break through and his kingdom break through in this reality. And we get to be a part of that as the body of Christ. In the Lord's Prayer, as I mentioned, we pray for God's kingdom to come and will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we should think about that when we're praying it, right? It's not just a phrase. We are praying for God to break through this place and to set up his godly, good, holy reality in our lives and in the lives of others. So that's how I'm using the phrase kingdom of God. So I don't feel like I have to explain it every time. Now we can go. So our scripture passage um, that you've been in, Acts 3, verses 11 through 21, I'm reading out of the ESV here. So I'm going to read through this passage, um, and then we're going to dig into it a little bit more uh, deeply. While he clung to Peter and John, the man who was healed, all the people utterly astounded, and I underline that because that's a great phrase. They were utterly astounded. Um, in Iowa, there's a cow joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going to make it. They were utterly astounded, and they ran together to Peter and John and this man, to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So that's a pretty heavy way to start addressing a crowd, right? You killed Jesus. <laughs> and by his name, the name of Jesus, by faith in his name, has made this man, this man who was healed, strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus." whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about God, which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. So this is a good passage. It's a great passage. It's a convicting passage, wherever we are today. And it speaks heavily into the reality of what I was talking about, about this passion for the Christian church to come alive and to do what God has called it to do and to participate how God has called us to participate. But there's a lot of challenges facing the church in the Western world, right? And in the United States and in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and in Story City. There's so many challenges. What are some of those challenges? There are a lot. And so from here on out, my message this morning looks at three main challenges that encompass many of the others, right? And the idea here is to point them out and to speak those challenges 
also to figure out and ask ourselves how we can rise to that challenge and grow, and then to find some encouragement for each one of these as well. So challenge number one, and again, when I say we, I include myself, and I, I'm talking about the Western church, um, so I'm not just pointing at Oasis, you, it's, it, it's we, it's a, it's a we thing. Challenge one, we don't participate in the kingdom work of Jesus. In Matthew 6, Jesus tells us not to be anxious about anything, right? Perhaps you're familiar with that passage. And all the basic things that God promises to tend to in that passage are things that we spend most of our times and lives and energy tending to. The food, the money, the clothing, the appearances. That's where most of our time and effort is put in our culture today. Matthew 6.33 says to seek first the kingdom of God, this kingdom reality, up there and here, and all of these things will be added to you as well. In other words, the kingdom of God is here. It's wherever God is reigning, right? It's wherever God is Lord. So it could be here and it could be over there and it could be in the third world and it could be in Story City and it can be here in this place in our midst gathered as the body of Christ this morning. God's will and God's desires and God's grace should be the primary focus of our lives. God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things that we tend to spend our time and our money and our resources on, God's going to take care of all the important things that actually matter, right? And when Jesus says to seek first, this isn't a passive seeking. This isn't I'm going for a walk and I happen to notice a bird. This is active. The, the Greek word zeteo implies that this is active, that we would meditate on it, that we would strive for it, which involves some work and some effort, and that we would crave it. That's my favorite definition. We would crave the kingdom of God. We are to crave the kingdom of God first, and all these other things in our lives that matter can be built on that foundation, and God will tend to those. So the challenge is we don't participate in the kingdom work of Jesus. Maybe we need some coaching there. Maybe we need some truth spoken into our lives. Maybe the body of Christ needs to get back to the basics in some ways. How can we rise to this challenge? <clears throat> How might God be calling you today and us today to be more open and willing to participate in the beautiful gift of grace known as the kingdom of God. Maybe that's a new concept for you. Maybe that's something you've visited before and you're working on it. But I do think God isn't going to force us or coerce us into participating in his kingdom, right? Like we, we get to be a partner in this work. We're not forced servitude, right? So we can ask ourselves, how can we be more willing and open to participating in the kingdom of God? To orient our life on the foundation of Jesus. To have the, the big thing, the main thing, be the foundation of our lives, and that is Jesus and his kingdom, rather than building on all the other things that we're tempted to build on. How can we say yes to participating in the work of Jesus? And some encouragement along those lines, because that might seem really abstract and nebulous to you, um, and it might seem like something that's just really hard in this world. But to encourage you, I want to say that you can actually build your life on Jesus and his kingdom, or else Jesus wouldn't have told us to do that. We can seek the kingdom of God first, and that means we can find it, because Jesus wouldn't send us on some futile quest to do something that we can't actually do, right? So we can build our lives on Jesus and his kingdom. It is a reality. It is possible. And we can say yes to participating. It's like that gift is right here, and Jesus is like, hey, let's do this together, right? And we have the best counselor and the best friend known to humanity in the Holy Spirit. Meaning that even in this, we're not alone. And God's power in us, the Holy Spirit, helps us to rise to this challenge and participate in the kingdom of God. So it's a big challenge for the Western church. We're not really participating a whole lot, but there's hope. We can rise to this challenge 
and we can find encouragement and direction through the Holy Spirit. So building on that challenge, the second one is this. Our eyes are not open to what God is doing in us and around us. And this might be generally the case. This also might be very specifically the case for us. It's very possible to be kingdom-minded and say, Lord, I want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. It's possible to have that good theology and that good foundation and a relationship with Jesus, but we still don't pause and take time to look and to see what God is doing and to acknowledge what God is doing. For everyone in the crowd in the Acts passage, right, there was this crowd around Peter and John and the man that was healed. For everyone there, there was likely a dozen who didn't stop, who didn't stay to listen, who was too busy, who had a task to do. And so we're not just assuming the entire city came. The city went on, and there was a small group of people that stopped to hear this story of what had happened to this man. And for me, this one really hits home because there's this daily grind we all have, right? It doesn't matter whether we're a student or going to college or whether we're retired. We tend to fill our lives up with lots of stuff and lots of things to do. So as a pastor, I think there's, what was the stat last, a couple weeks ago, Jody? 65 competencies we're expected to be proficient in as pastors. Now, a lot of your professions are like that too. Um, For me, I added the tech guy to all of that during COVID and having to get our church services online, much like what you've experienced here at Oasis. But there's this daily grind, and there's so many things that I have to be good at, and there's so many relationships that I have to tend to and balance, and that's the same in your lives as well. And it's so easy to put my head down and carry on and miss the people or the moments or the events that God wants me to tend to, to open my eyes to what his kingdom work is in the here and in the now. One of our points of emphasis at Emmanuel, uh, my church in Story City this summer, has been to recognize the kingdom of God. We've had a whole summer talking about this, going through the Gospel of Luke. And, And to recognize the principles that exhibit God's work in this world. Because I think that there's a lot of really good kingdom-minded people in the church. But I think we haven't been taught or coached on how to live our lives in a way that we're open and our eyes are open and we're looking actively for what God is doing in us and around us. So it's been a great refresher for me and a reminder and a challenge to live with intentional eyes so that I can see and discern where God is working in my life and around me. If I only tend to what I think I'm supposed to be doing today, if I leave no room for God to move or for the Holy Spirit to lead me otherwise, I'm probably going to miss it. The psalmist speaks to this eyes thing a lot, right? Psalm 119, 18 says this. It says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. God has wondrous things for us to put our eyes upon and tend to. Our physical eyes, yes, but also our souls. And then later in Psalm 119, 37, the psalmist writes, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Even Paul, as we, if we were to read on in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, the Saul turns into Paul. That's what we talk about, right? Paul has this dramatic encounter. And through God's power, these scales of blindness fall off his eyes. And in his previous life, before he met Jesus, he did not have eyes for the kingdom of God and for who Jesus was and for what Jesus was doing. But when he met Jesus, when he encountered God's kingdom, he looked at the world with a whole different set of eyes and his life changed so how can we rise to the challenge question for you to ponder on this because i think in our culture most of this challenge is about the pace of life that we live and the priorities that we've already set or adopted from the culture around us which may not be kingdom priorities so the question is this how might you slow down and pause and open your eyes to the work that God is doing and the work that God wants to do in your life and in the lives of others? How might we slow down and pause?
slow down and pause. This ties closely with our previous challenge. Our lives are often full of things that they don't need to be so full of. So how do you create that margin in your life? How do you stop and smell the roses, right? I think that's just a great little proverb for us. How do we stop and smell the roses of God's kingdom? How do we stop and see the kingdom? As followers of Jesus, this is a challenge I think we need to rise up to. And we might be surprised in all the areas that we see God working that we didn't notice before. So some encouragement here. Um, God's work is beautiful, okay? God's kingdom work is beautiful. And if we get out in nature, we recognize the beauty of what God can do, just like that sunrise I saw this morning. Um, And like the Rocky Mountains where I was a couple weeks ago, or like the beaches of Jamaica, when you take time to pause and look, you're actually going to be encouraged and blessed just by seeing God's kingdom, even before you jump in to be a part of it, right? Right? the beautiful things that God is doing will become a blessing for your life. And you'll want to see more of it. You'll want to be more attentive to those things. You'll want to see what God is doing in his love, in his mercy, and in his grace. It's a beautiful thing. So find some encouragement in that. Opening our eyes to the kingdom of God is probably going to do more to enrich and bless our lives and encourage us than our work in the kingdom of God might actually do for others. But then our work can also become that blessing and encouragement to somebody else as well. So find encouragement in that. So first challenge, we're not participating. Second challenge, our eyes aren't open. And the third challenge is this. And this really speaks to our text today. When we see God moving in us, in our lives, or around us, we rarely celebrate it, point it out, or share it with others. There's a lot of incredible things that have happened in our lives that we've not told the story of, or we've not framed and recognize God works in those times. We can have a good foundation, and we can have open eyes to the kingdom, and it's still possible for us to shy away from pointing out to others what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of those around us. So uh, at the retreat I've mentioned in July, we talked about something called sacred storytelling. Sacred storytelling. And the idea is um, that God's work in our lives And our encounters with Jesus Christ create sacred stories that are meant to be told. It becomes part of our story. It becomes part of our witness. Peter and John, in our Acts text this morning, waste no time telling the sacred story of Jesus. It starts with the healing. That's kind of what gets the attention. And so they recap this whole story. And in verse 16, it says this, His name by faith in his name, which is Jesus, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So the man is right here, and they don't skip and pass over that opportunity to point out, this is what Jesus is doing. This is what God is doing and has done, and it's because of Jesus. They tie it back to God's saving work of Jesus Christ which they're fresh living in the aftermath of his death and resurrection, right? They point out the power of the name of Jesus, and they point out the power of God's presence, even to miraculously heal. And they make sure that nobody thinks it's their power, and it's not some act of sorcery. No, this was God, and they tell God's story, and Israel's story, and Jesus' story, and then they call on the crowd to repent. Because if this is what can, God can do for this man, imagine what Jesus is in your life as well. If you experience the kingdom firsthand. Because there's a rich mercy found through faith in Jesus Christ. And I hope we would all agree with that this morning. Like there is a rich love and mercy found in Jesus Christ. I don't know about all the practices of Oasis and the church community forming here, but I know that the Western church tends to shy away from pointing out what God has done. And in a lot of ways, the church has turned in on itself so that we might celebrate things with each other that deserve to be told to the masses. And we might turn in on ourselves as individuals and say, thanks, God, in our prayers, but never tell somebody how God has changed and influenced and blessed our life. 
That's a sacred story that deserves to be told. And each and every one, every person who has encountered Jesus in his grace has a story, has a story to tell. Whether that encounter was earlier than you even remember or whether that encounter was something later in life where Jesus turned your life around, we all have a story to tell. And when God moves mountains in our lives or when God simply gives us his peace in the crazy turmoil of this world and COVID and whatever it else it is that we face on a daily basis, that becomes a story for us to tell. It becomes something sacred. It becomes an opportunity to point out what Jesus is doing in our lives and in the lives of those around us that we love. How can we rise to this challenge? I think some self-reflection is good. Where, where do we need, where do you need to point out God's love and God's mercy and God's power to save in your life and around you? Where are those sacred stories? Where do you see God working in your life? And how can we put that into words to share with somebody else? God has done and is doing things in your life. I hope you see that. And if not, my prayer is that your eyes would be open to that. God has done and is doing things in the lives of others around you. And these are things that are meant to be celebrated. Point them out, both for the benefit of the body of Christ and for the witness to the culture and the world that we live in that does not know the name of Jesus Christ. Because we want them to hear and believe in the name of Jesus. And we don't do it to say, look at us, right? Peter and John said, no, it's not about us. It's about God's power through Jesus Christ. We say, look at our awesome God. Our God loves. Our God saves. And through Jesus Christ, we have found grace and salvation and the hope to face tomorrow. So where in our lives do we see that story that deserves to be told? Some encouragement. We are blessed with the gospel. Like, we have the best news ever, right? If we call it the good news. We could call it the best news. We are blessed with this vision of God's love and God's mercy and God's work and God's kingdom. And we have a testimony when we've met Jesus Christ, we have a story to tell. And so when you say to this world, look what our awesome God has done for us, we become torchbearers. Just like in the Olympics, we become torchbearers of that good news, of that gospel. We become participants in God's incredible kingdom. So this might seem like a lot, a lot of reflection questions in there, I know, sorry. It's early, right? No. I've had plenty of coffee, so I'm good. Uh, I want to recap and summarize here, and then we're going to have a little reflection time, just a minute or so, um, to address those questions, and they'll be up on the screen. So the three big challenges we face are this. First, we don't participate in the kingdom work of Jesus. So how might God be calling us today to be more open and willing to participate, to take that step into this beautiful gift of grace known as the kingdom of God? The second challenge was this, our eyes are not open to what God is doing in and around us. So how might we slow down and pause and open our eyes to the work that God is doing and that God wants to do? And then the third is this, when we see God moving in us or around us, we rarely celebrate it, we rarely point it out. So where do we see those stories in our lives and in those around us that we can point out. And maybe that's to encourage other believers. Maybe that's to encourage somebody who doesn't know the name of Jesus. Both of those things are great. Who is God calling you to point it out to is the next question. So I want to spend a few minutes. They're going to put on a little reflection music um, so that you can think through these. And we'll leave the questions up, hopefully. Um, how might God be calling you today to be more open and willing to participate? How might you slow down and pause and open your eyes to God's kingdom? And where do you need to point out God's love and mercy? So let's spend a little time. There might be music or it might be quiet, but the quiet is okay too. So let's think about those things.
blessed that you have called us your children and you have called us into your kingdom. And sometimes, Lord, we think that that's a reality meant for eternity in heaven. Lord, show us that it is a reality meant for today and tomorrow and the next day. Lord, we all come from different places. We all have different challenges in our lives. But one thing that unites us all is Jesus and the blood of the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit that you give us as your church to be coached and directed to experience tangibly your grace and your love. And so this morning, Lord, our prayers are this. Lord, that you would lead us and empower us to participate in this kingdom work that you've set before us as your church. And Lord, that we would have open eyes, that we would be able to see Jesus working and see the Holy Spirit working and go join in our own hearts, in our own minds, in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, and to the ends of the earth, Lord. You are working. We believe it. So empower us to jump in and join and see where you are working. And Lord, help us to share this really great news. Help us to remind each other of the great news of Jesus Christ, to tell our sacred stories, when we have seen and encountered and experienced your love and your provision in our lives and in the lives of our families. Lord, a big part of your kingdom work is celebrating your kingdom. A big part of following Jesus is celebrating what Jesus has done through the cross. And the incredible grace that you've called us into so, Lord, we pray through these things, Lord, would you rise us up to the challenge? Would you help us to be the light, to be the hope of Jesus Christ shining through us to this world? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.